Hey everybody, it is Friday. Hope you're having a blessed day and uh, I'm sitting in, in Mocha's here. I've been discussing with people and studying and phone calls and interruptions. I've recorded this a couple times, but I just really want to spend some time with you. Take a break and get into the word. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to pick up at verse 15. Let's pick down at verse 16, because we know where we're at. John has uh, consented and is baptizing Jesus. For What an interesting thing for John to realize. No, wow, Jesus, I need to be baptized by you in Matthew chapter 3. But Jesus says, you know, let it be so. This is verse 15. Let it be so. Now, it is proper for us to do to fulfill all righteousness. We talked about that yesterday. But then we pick up at verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized... He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him, or just landing on him. And a voice of one from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased beautiful words we get to see. The beginning of Jesus' ministry, it started with that journey. Now it culminates into an affirmation of his ministry. Important thing to see, it's also an affirmation of John's ministry. John has said that he was the one in the wilderness. The, the verse that was quoted, I'm the one calling from the wilderness. This is all the way in back of verse 3. A voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And this is an affirmation of who that was, who the him was. Scripture will also say that Jesus, John didn't do any miracles. His job was just to preach the news that Jesus is coming and to repent, to change your ways, to change your path. Now, the, the baptism of repentance is still standing in this idea to change your path. An important thing for us to understand and seeing in baptism. But, but even in this, we saw that John realized, wait a second. Jesus is, is his cousin. He knew Jesus. He's like, wait a second. You need to baptize me. What Jesus did and what Jesus does and will always do is never ask us to do anything he wouldn't. Now we'll later on and see more about this idea of baptism, but, but it's this affirmation or this obedience that Jesus does. And to start his ministry off, he begins with obedience. He, he, was, he, he took the obligation of taking the distance. Now he's in the obedience of, to be baptized. Now I want to show you something I think is beautiful in these last verses of chapter 13 or chapter 3. We'll look next week or tomorrow, Saturday, at chapter 4. In chapter 4, there's the testing. And we'll look into that, what that looks like. It's, it, the word testing and temptation can be the same word in the Bible. And we're going to see this testing or tempting of Jesus and, and then watch him stand through that. But where we're at in this moment is, is I want to present a thought. Now this is just my thought and just a quick moment to share with you. But I've always pondered this as you notice. As you read through scripture, you will find a huge gap in Jesus' life. And that is the 30 years. We get to when he's born, and possibly a year or two later when, when the Magi do come. It probably took about two years, but we don't hear any much more of Jesus. We could also hear that when John was in the womb, or John was born, Jesus rolled or moved in the womb, Mary says, because he understood that John was there. And we can also look at the age 12, right? At age 12, what happened? Remember that at age 12, that, that Jesus was asking questions. But after that, it's kind of silent. I find it interesting, this silence and the lesson in the silence of what it is to be quiet and just lean in to God. I say that because that's hard for me. But that's what happened. For, for some 30 years, Jesus is just silent and getting to know God. Scripture says he grew in wisdom and stature. But for 30 years, he just, and I use the word just very lightly, lived with God. And then his ministry began. Began with baptism, that affirmation of, 
of, of being immersed into it. Baptism was a full immersion into water. And as he is being dipped into water and then pulled out of water, he has made this commitment of, of obedience. And God says these words. And this is what I think is so important. This is my son with whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Let me explain something. Before the foundation of the world, the scheme of salvation was set and planned. Jesus knew. Jesus coming to this earth and putting on human flesh, 100% man and 100% God, was not plan B or plan 2. That was the plan from the beginning. And why that was the plan from the beginning is God has planned and purposed you, and he's planned and purposed me, and he's set the course and the path, and he gave up some connection. I don't even fully understand it. But he gave it up. Now he is still 100% God. Let that be known. We'll see later, but he says it more clearly in John that he does nothing on his own will but everything that his Father wants him to do. The Holy Spirit gives him the guidance and the strength to do. He does nothing on his own will. He is, yes, still God, but he set that aside. We also can see in Scripture that no one knows the hour of the day except the Father, not even Jesus. You see it? For 30 years, he didn't get to talk with God. Now this is an assumption, but scripture doesn't say. Scripture doesn't say he got to hear the voice of the Lord. But for 30 years, Jesus on this earth, studying the word, his mother telling him who he was, and the obedient faith of Jesus. Now that's a very important thing because we can see that in Colossians. We can see that faith described in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. It says that we're not saved by your faith but by the faith that saved. That's Jesus' faith. For 30 years. Silence. Still having the scrolls in the Old Testament. But do you imagine that? To start his ministry off, Jesus obeys, he takes the long journey, he partners with John, he parallels with us, and then the Spirit descended and remained on him, as other versions will say, and the unity of God is restored. What are you saying, Robert? When we understand God, we see God in a threefold, a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. We'll talk more on that some other time, but that's really what it is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that's a powerful thing for us to understand. But for 30 years, the power of it was for a son to hear a father say, you're my son. I love you, and I am pleased with you. Hope you understand that. That that is a, a wonderful lesson for us to see, that there's a unity restored at this moment of baptism. That's the same thing for us in baptism. That we're made new. We're born again with Christ. We're added into the family. And the beauty of what that is, that that testimony starts. Now, after this, this, this disclaimer, this statement of power, we're now going to see a testing of it. That's chapter 4. I encourage you to read that. We won't have time to break it down all the way, but we will see that we're going to hear that Jesus is tested in a threefold part. A lust of the flesh and a lust of eyes and the pride of life, but it stems on how did Jesus stand on that testing? He, he observed, he obeyed, and was affirmed. And the unity of God was complete. He's my son, whom I love, who I'm well pleased. Let me tell you what, God wants to say that to you. wants to say, well done, I love you, you're my child. Get into your word daily. Listen to what God has to say. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.